Welcome to Mid-Century Living, your weekly podcast about everything mid-century and how to bring the mid-century vibe to your everyday life. Welcome to Mid-Century Living, the show where we talk all about the mid-century then and now. We're your hosts, Gonzalo and Jackie. Welcome everybody to our second ever full episode and our first episode on a specific topic, which is very exciting. Uh, but first, let's just catch up. Uh, Gonzalo, how's your week going? Good. So my week was, in a word, long. Um, it was the first day, first week, sorry, of school, or first full week of school for students. You guys might remember that I'm a teacher. Uh, so it's been a end, an end to my summer, both at work at school, but also it was my first week of classes in grad school because as an adult, I thought I didn't have enough going on in my plate and I needed more challenges. Uh, but all that ended with this morning, Saturday, when I was making breakfast and I made some breakfast scones out of a pancake mix. And then I proceeded to think that it wasn't quite good enough for my butter. So I opened one, put it in the toaster, and then I started watching YouTube and I wasn't paying attention and I burned the toast. Smoke and everything included. So it was, it was that kind of start to my day. That's a good start to your day. <laughs> Hopefully yours was better. I'm still stuck on the idea that you made scones out of a pancake mix. Did you just wing it or is that a... There were instructions on how to make scones and muffins in the box and... I have a recipe for scones that I like, so I kind of reached into that as I w and then stopped following the directions because I wanted them to be a little bit more um, scony and less pancakey. Hmm. So I kind of made it my own, and then I realized after baking that I should have added a little bit more baking powder to make them rise a little bit more. I just assumed that the pancake mix had some leavening, leveling. Yeah, like it usually leavening, does. Whatever the word is. Well, I know at least Bisquick does. That's its appeal. Um, so they were good in taste, but in the, like, I, I'm sure if you guys um, over in podcast land saw these, uh, you would say that's not a scone. <laughs> yeah, I totally get it. I've done a lot of healthy swap fails that I think are delicious. But anyone else I try to feed it to think it's the worst thing they've ever had. So <laughs> that sounds <laughs> familiar. But then you're proud of it because you made it. Yeah, I, I, oh, I often try things. Like when I do a cake for someone, I will always have enough batter to make a tiny mini cake just so that I can try it. Just to make sure that it tastes good before I give it to someone. That's smart. Um, well, that's just me. Well, how was your week? <laughs> My week was good. Um, I didn't do any baking because it's summer. But I know this is coming out in September, but we're actually recording this in very late August. And it is a thousand degrees in Dallas right now. And um, I'm having a particularly hard time balancing the fact that it is definitely summer outside but I am so ready for fall inside that I'm thinking about just rotating my Pyrex display right now so just a heads up to the audience I have um, a hutch in my kitchen and I have enough Pyrex actually that I can rotate it seasonally not as much as some people on the internet but enough that I can do like a spring summer collection and a fall winter collection so for spring and summer, which is what I currently have, I use spring blossom green and butterfly gold, which is a nice avocado and harvest yellow color scheme. And then for fall winter, I swap it all out for autumn wheat, which is all orange and red orange and early American, which really reminds me of Thanksgiving. And I think it's like perfect for harvest season, but I'm trying to figure out how I can do seasonally appropriate fall so I'm thinking I'm probably coming up on Pyrex touch rotating season and that is the most exciting thing happening in my life at the moment but 
Well, I hope that you post some of these pictures of your Pyrex collection on Instagram. Where can where can we find you on Instagram? Oh, that was sweet of you to plug. Uh, so if you follow me at Thoroughly Min Modern on Instagram, every time I update the Pyrex touch, I am updating it on Instagram. So give me a follow there if you're into that sort of thing. But in the meantime, I suppose we could just get to today's topic, which is not Pyrex, but is instead 1950s fashion. For today, we're going to talk about the 50s. So here we go. So you can't start a conversation about 50s fashion without talking about 40s fashion, mainly because during the war, clothing and fabric and just textiles in general were rationed so hard. This is a lot of the reason why the 50s look like the 50s today, is that um, there were just years of deprivation during World War II where luxury was just not a thing that people could achieve. And we were just making do with what we could make do with. And all of a sudden, 1947, Christian Dior comes out with his new look. And it is fabulous. It is tiny, tiny waists, giant, giant full skirts, just getting back into just the feminine shape, lots of fabric, wherever you can put the fabric, there is fabric, it is elegant, it is stylish, it is elevated, the accessories all match, it is just totally the opposite of the um, sleek A-line skirts, boxy silhouettes, shoulder pads for both men and women, like the 40s were a very specific shape, and the fifth and Dior just decided that let's just not do that anymore. Let's get back to our a natural shape. Let's accentuate the positives. Everything is totally different. So like I feel like mentioning the 40s is necessary just to talk about the early 50s. So the change, the main changes from the 1940s are shoulders become soft instead of squared like they were in the 40s. The figure was more hourglass instead of boxy, and the slim straight shorter skirts from the 40s are now full skirts that end at mid-calf. They just want, want to use all that fabric that we couldn't use back then. It's very, very exciting. So we went from, sorry, we went from shorter skirts to longer skirts? Yes. So uh, 1940s, usually skirts then ended right under the knee. It was, still, I mean, shorter skirts relative to 1940s was not really shorter skirts these days, but they were shorter compared to 50s because 50s was more big, full, voluminous skirts that ended right after your calves. So skirts always in women's fashion try to end at a, a small part of the leg. That's something that's always been, even when we get to the 60s and we get to mini skirts, if we go that far into the 60s, it's always like a narrow part of your thigh or right under the knee where the knee, but right before the knee comes out to become the calf, that's usually where the forties were. And then after your calf, right before when, it, when the leg narrows again, before it meets your ankles is another good place to cut off your leg. You never want to do it in the middle of a thick part because it doesn't make the most flattering line. So that's something that fashion has always paid attention to in hemlines. And in the 40s, since we were rationing fabric, shorter was practical. <laughs> Makes sense. You brought up Dior. Have you ever seen uh, Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris? No. No, I have not. But it is on my oh. list. Have you seen it? I watched parts of it. So um, we went on a cruise this, this summer with my family, and they had three movies playing in the room like on a loop and one of them was Mrs. Harris goes to Paris. So I've seen bits and pieces and I thought it was funny enough that I added it to my list when I go home, but I have not sat down to watch it. No, it's definitely on my list. So, so um, the Dior new look again, accentuated the tiny waist. So bodices were always super tight in dresses and a lot of what made this look work was foundation garments and those of us in the vintage style community know that foundation garments are totally the difference between looking vintage inspired and looking true vintage a lot of the clothing from this period sewing patterns from this period if you sew 
um, are all assuming that you will wear very firm foundation garments and bullet bras. So this was a very specific shape that clothing was fitted around, um, always trying to make your waist as thin as possible. And some people even wore hip pads. A lot of people wore petticoats. A lot of the big full skirts that you're looking at required that extra floof. Um, I live in Texas, so I do not wear petticoats, but I do know some people who do, and they all live in the north because it is not 110 degrees in the summer there, and they can do stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> and out of all that, I actually know what a petticoat is. Don't ask how. Oh, you're right. Oh, I should probably not assume that everyone who listens to the podcast knows what a petticoat is. So it is a foundation garment that is several layers of tulle. Um, back in the day, it was cotton, actually, so they were slightly breathable, but it is still many, many layers of gathered fabric uh, to add more body to your skirts. An important note about petticoats, for those of you trying to apply these rules to current day, um, you are not supposed to be able to see them poking out under your skirts. Uh, if you saw a petticoat under someone's skirt, it's basically like their underwear is showing. I know a lot of modern rockabilly-esque sort of pinup photography. People are like showing peaks of their petticoats, but that's actually super scandalous and not really appropriate. Do not design your outfit with layers of tulle peeking out under your skirt. They should be exactly the length of or shorter than your skirt so that they add body to the skirt, but you don't actually see it while you're walking around. So that is the etiquette for that. <laughs> so that is the, the new look. It was this big fancy thing. It was very put together. Your accessories, your shoes all matched. It was this beautiful thing. Um, but in privacy, women dressed a lot more casual than that, um, more simple and comfortable. Women did wear pants mostly indoors in the 50s. Eventually, pants will move out into the public, but for now, it is all indoors um, or hiking, camping, sportswear. In privacy, women still wore mainly dresses. House dresses are a thing. They are more kind of in that 40s shape, just enough fabric to give it some shape, but not enough fabric that it gets in the way when you're bending over or trying to clean anything. All usually 100% cotton, breathable, something easy to move around in, and pants, trousers, Bermuda shorts, all that sort of thing were mainly um, sportswear or gardening. Around the mid-50s, people started to get tired of all of that extra shopping and all of that extra formality, and fashions get a little more casual. The Dior suits um, are still around, but then there's people like Coco Chanel who totally rebelled against that aesthetic and that shape, and she starts introducing boxy suits, slim suits, straight skirts, basically trying to do the exact opposite of all of the new look aesthetic. So around the mid to late 50s, you start getting a contrast of super big full skirts or really narrow straight skirts. Some shoulder pads start coming back in. Um, that boxy look starts coming back in. You get chemise dresses. So one very exciting thing about the late 50s is that synthetic fibers start coming into play and we get polyester and we get rayon, which were commonly referred to as miracle fabrics because they're very easy to wash and very easy to wear. They don't wrinkle, so you don't spend the entire day ironing them. And this is super exciting for people who are maintaining their own clothes at home. Most people don't bring things to cleaners. They're doing all their laundry at home. So polyester and rayon were total game changers. Nylon, in particular, also came about during the synthetic fiber boom and... It was heavily restricted during the war effort, but now all of a sudden we can use it for clothing and most notably stockings, which up until now were made from silk and the silk stockings were still highly sought after these days actually. But nylon stockings are way lower maintenance, way more comfortable for some people and they became so popular people just started calling stockings nylons at this point instead of calling stockings stockings. And we still use that phrase huh. today, or at least some people do. I know my grandmother still calls them nylons. So anyway, that is 
the highlights of women's fashion in the 50s. So for men, um, they also saw a similar change from the 40s. Shoulder pads were removed. Pants no longer have pleats or cuffs. We started adding more texture into suits, tweed and corduroy. Jackets in the 40s used to go in at the waist, but now jackets go straight down from shoulders down, so straight at the hip. So it's a totally different silhouette for men's suits as well. Um, most men, up until this point, were wearing hats every single day, but in the 50s, it was mainly middle-aged men that were keeping hats, but the younger generation saw no need for them. So they spent more time on their hair, actually, and didn't wear hats ever. Um, but the older generation held on to hats for a lot longer. I wish we still had hats. I mean, I would wear a hat. I mean, I would wear the whole outfit as well, not just a hat with like my t-shirt, because I feel like that would look ridiculous. But I wish we had hats. And not only because I am of the age where the hair on the head is no longer happening. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a look. Um, but the hair in the 50s, I can see why they didn't want to wear hats because, and we'll get to that a little bit later, though I suppose we could jump to it now. So the greaser style that many of us associate with 50s men wear, men's wear was actually mainly youth culture, usually teenagers through the 20s. Um, the bulk of society actually, 20 and up, still dressed very formal during the day. It was gray suits. When you want to stand out, maybe a brown or a blue suit. Um, in the summer, you still wear suits, but it was lighter colors. So you'll wear maybe linen or seersucker. There's sort of the Palm Beach style aesthetic where you're wearing navy jackets with white pants. But it was still very formal during the day and people only really changed into casual attire after work and on the weekends. So the greaser style that most people associate was really teenagers. Um, same with women, actually. I didn't mention that at all. The poodle skirts and bobby socks. That is teenage 50s fashion. Um, what I focused on in my little spiel up there was mainly women. So basically the grease lightning look is not representative of actual 1950s fashion. Well, the thing is, it actually is for the time, for the age group that they're trying to represent in Greece. So you forget or most of us forget that Greece was teenagers. It was high school. So that was oh, yeah. probably very accurate for high schoolers of that time. But just because they were played by 25 year olds doesn't mean that's how 25 year olds dressed. <laughs> they were dressed appropriately for teenagers in the fifties. Adults did not dress that way. Um, there were, however, uh, like felt circle skirts were a thing for slightly older, but they weren't poodles necessarily uh saddle shoes all of that was teenage fashion from the 50s what's interesting about greaser style in american fashion in the 50s is that a lot of that is sort of it's very interesting to contrast it with what 50s fashion was doing in the uk so in the uk um the teddy boys came up with basically appropriating Edwardian suits and dressing them down to be kind of rough and casual looking. So they would get suits and then, but like narrow the trousers and the jackets and wear their like pompadours and slick back hair and smoke their cigarettes outside of businesses. And that's how they were dressing down fashion. But in the U S we used the same sort of hairstyles, but we, when we went casual, we went casual. And we were basically basing our style off of James Dean and Elvis and Joe House Rock. And it was jeans, t-shirts, leather jackets, same pompadour sort of hairstyle. But it was actually a pretty big deal because up until this point in time, jeans were not something you wore in public. That was something that you wore when you were working on your house, working on the, like that was junk clothes. And all of a sudden, people are wearing jeans in public. So they weren't acceptable for everyday wear at all until the late 50s. So that is a big landmark achievement of 1950s fashion. Huh. And I think that's 
that is all my thoughts on 1950s men and women's fashion. That's at least the highlights, anyway. One thing I did notice, or one thing I did forget to mention about men's fashion, is that while they were getting more casual, they started wearing more colors and bigger patterns. So plaid starts becoming a thing. Contrasting elbow patches start becoming a thing. Very exciting <laughs> taste of what is to come when we get to the 60s and 70s in men's fashion, which is very tacky, and I cannot wait. <laughs> Do you have any history questions before I get into the bringing the style to life segment? Uh, no, I'm actually excited to hear about how we can bring this today, because um, like I mentioned earlier, I have no style, so I am open to starting a style. <laughs> well, I um, would be remiss if I didn't say that anyone starting to dress vintage now, really, I cannot recommend enough the website VintageDancer.com. It is this husband and wife team that all they do is research fashion history and they compile all of these histories. I'm going to link them in the show notes. Um, but you can basically look, go to their website by decade and they will have photos of old catalogs, very, very thorough histories, and um, shoppable links by category. So if you're looking specifically for 1950s Western wear, for example, they have a whole page devoted to historical accurate images and shoppable links. Anyway, they're great. So I cannot recommend them enough. If you're just starting out, definitely go to that website and read and tell them that we sent you. So maybe they'll come on the podcast one day. That would be swell. That would. Um, as to where to shop now, personally, uh, most of my recommendations are all women's clothing. But um, a couple of these brands do sell men's occasionally. A good resource for those just starting out would be uniquevintage.com. Um, there's a hyphen between unique and vintage. I'm again, I'm going to link all of these in the show notes, but unique vintage is great because you can also shop by decade. So that is super useful. Um, they have a lot of their quality is hit and miss. Their house brands are okay. They also sell some other brands. Um, so just definitely read the reviews before you buy anything. Um, when I started dressing vintage, my bread and butter was pinup girl clothing, which I have to mention. Um, they've gotten a lot more modern in style now, but honestly, this company taught me how to dress, so I cannot, in good conscience, not mention them. So a lot of, a lot of their designs are more modern in shape. But if you look specifically for the Jenny dresses and skirts, the Dietrich, the Dietrich trousers, the peasant tops, um, all of those are still very vintage accurate and modern fun prints um m nowadays most of my clothing is handmade but if i haven't made it myself i've probably bought it from vixen by micheline pitt which is um she used to work for pinup girl clothing and then split out on her own and is now flourishing um all of her stuff is beautiful very well made the quality is there, and also she's mostly recently gotten to some licensed collections, so while she may not be period accurate in prints, the shapes, the silhouettes, all still vintage, um, and if you are part vintage at heart and part modern at heart, she's got a lot of licensed collections that are very exciting. I am particularly excited about um, the Halloween collection that just launched. I just ordered a very adorable chartreuse full skirt with spider webs all over it. I am so excited. It's supposed to show up sometime in late September, so I'm gonna wear it all October long. So get ready for that. Um, if you are on a budget, I recommend Collectif Clothing. Um, they also have menswear. They have a lot of very cool casual men's button down shirt, sweaters, um, some trousers, I think, but they are mainly 50s, awesome, casual clothing on a budget. I get all of my shoes from Bait Footwear. 
Um, and you can also shop by decade on that website. Most of the shoes that I buy from them are actually from the 40s collection, but I just find them super comfortable because the heels are low and anyway. Um, and those are my favorite brands that I personally shop from. Some other brands worth mentioning are Heart of Hot, which are 50s and 60s, and they go up to a 4XL, um, and they're all made in the U.S. and very pretty. I just don't uh, personally have a lot from them. Vivian of Holloway is a U.K.-based brand, and it is mainly 40s and 50s, very, very authentic style and materials. And then if you are a jeans person, um, I am not a jeans person, but if you are a jeans person, then you need to buy your vintage jeans from Lady K Loves, which are notorious in the vintage dressing community for having the perfect high-waist jeans. Um, they also have pencil skirts and sweaters, and they are also UK-based, if I didn't already say that. And that is where you can go to start incorporating 50s fashion in your everyday life. I will link all of these brands in the show notes. I find it funny that you, you, the last thing you mentioned was a UK-based company about high-waisted jeans because I just saw an interview of um, Olivia Coleman and Emily Clark, and they in their in their conversation they made a comment about how high-waisted jeans uh, are making a comeback. And Olivia Coleman, I think it was the one who said that that was her choice for a fashion that had gone away that should stay away and then she changed her mind because they're making that comeback i think that's how it went yes. um listeners don't get too mad at me if i misquoted the interview but see that's a thing about pants i know that a lot of people have very strong feelings on this but i i'm probably because i based my main fashion inspiration off the 50s but i just feel like pants are supposed to end at the smallest part of your waist. And if they if they stop halfway up, like mid-rise pants and jeans do, you just get muffins. <laughs> so, cool. Uh, now that we know a little bit about 1950s fashion, how to bring it to today, um, I hope to see a lot of you guys posting on Instagram about your newfound 1950s style. And I will definitely update you guys when and if I get a style. Uh, <laughs> but one thing I wanted to also talk about today, um, in our Meet the Host episode, we had a slight tangent about proper dinner etiquette. And we've received some listener mail from you guys asking for more. So I wanted to start off a new segment in our podcast, and I have an etiquette tip to share with you. And this is yeah. an etiquette tip from a book called Etiquette for Young Moderns from 1954, which is geared, geared towards teenagers and etiquette for them, uh, which side note, maybe if my students are listening, they can take note. But today's tip is about introductions. So here are the rules for introduction according to this book. One, you introduce men and boys to women and girls. And then you introduce younger people to older people. So there's specific rules about who talks first and who talks second, uh, which I found very interesting. Um, and the book also goes as far as listing out acceptable and unacceptable phrases to use. Uh, during an introduction. So for example, you could say, I'd like to introduce, or I'd like you to meet, but you wouldn't say things like meet and shake hands with this person. Um, may I present is also considered too formal, which is interesting because when we think of etiquette, um, at least when I think of etiquette, I think of, may I present to you this person? Uh, right. But that's too formal for teenagers in the 1950s. <laughs> yeah so also when you're introduced to someone you should simply acknowledge it with how do you do or hello and don't use freely phrases and i like the word freely freely <laughs> phrases like charmed so yeah that is some of the phrases that you could use and you could not use and also men and boys must always shake hands when introduced to each other but when a man is introduced to a woman it's up to her to extend her hand first. 
So have you heard about these rules before? You know, I've heard things about etiquette changing when young people address older people and vice versa. Um, but I haven't heard it in this much detail, so that was super interesting. Basically, I feel like manners go a long way, so I vote keep. I say we keep this etiquette tip. Sounds good. So it looks, you know, I'm going to agree. I think we should also keep it. Um, so I think we should give it the mid-century living stamp of approval. Uh, and with that, I think our plane has landed. So send us an email to info.mcliving at gmail.com with any comments. Maybe you, you have some stuff about 1950s fashion uh, or maybe some future show ideas. All right, guys. So thank you guys again for tuning in today and listening to our episode on 1950s fashion. And we will see you guys in our upcoming episode next week. Bye. Thank you for listening to Mid-Century Living. Please subscribe, tell your friends, and leave a review. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also follow us on Instagram at MCL Podcast. See you next Friday.